Hello everyone, how's it going? I know in the last video, we talked about nomenclature. We did an introduction to kind of the grammar rules of organic chemistry. And we're gonna be talking more about that later on when we introduce new functional groups and molecules. But I wanna start working on describing bonding. And usually in organic chemistry, we reference methane one carbon and four hydrogens. But to understand what's going on between the bonding of the hydrogens and the carbon, we have to talk about atomic orbitals that helps us talk about hybridization and the Vesper theory. In order for us to really gain an understanding about what's happening with the electrons in covalent bonding, we have to talk about the principle that's called the wave particle duality. This means that the electrons are gonna act both as a wave and a particle. And I know that can sound confusing, but this principle is gonna really help us understand and lay out the fundamentals of both atomic orbitals and electron density, things that we're gonna reference a lot throughout organic chemistry and other chemistry classes. Let's start off by talking about some of the characteristics of waves. We have the crest, which is the high point of the wave, the trough, which is the low point of the wave, the wavelength, the distance between two crests or two troughs, we have the amplitude, which is the height of the wave. Then we have the frequency. The frequency is the number of wave cycles that happen per unit of time. And it's usually related to seconds. Now, frequency is related to energy. And since frequency and wavelength are inversely related, if we have a higher wavelength, we'll have a lower frequency. Now let's start associating what we learned about with waves and talking more about how it relates with atomic orbitals. Now, the scientist Schrodinger, I probably mispronounced that, created an equation to help us always describe the amplitude of the wave at any given energy level. One of the interesting things is, is that energy is quantized, meaning that there's a limitation to discrete values in which the energy can equal. Now, we have an equation to describe the amplitude of the wave at different energy outputs and help us understand its properties. But there's another issue. The uncertainty principle states that we can't simultaneously measure both the electron's location and velocity. And by measuring its location, we can't measure its velocity. And by measuring its velocity, we can't measure its location. So that's extremely limiting. And this is where we go to talk about probability density, which leads into electron density. By squaring the wave function, this value will always be positive, we create a 3D plot of the probability of finding the electron in space. And what the interesting thing is, is that this probability density is what leads to us forming the atomic orbitals. Now, there's a thing called a node. A node is when the probability of finding the electron or the probability density equals zero. And you can see the nodes on the diagram and they're labeled in yellow understanding what a probability density is in regards to an electron, we can now understand what an atomic orbital is at different energy levels. For instance, an atomic orbital is a 3D geometric shape representing and encompassing 90% of the probability density at that energy level. And this is why we will have different shapes and sizes for different atomic orbitals. So now let's talk about some of the characteristics that define atomic orbitals. And we label these the quantum numbers. There's three main ones. We have the principal quantum number, which describes the energy associated with that given orbital. And we usually represent this with the letter N. Remember, energy is quantized. So we're going to start with one, then two, then three for the N values. Angular quantum number. Well, the angular quantum number describes the shape of the atomic orbital. Now the possibilities of the angular quantum number is n minus one. Next is the magnetic quantum number. It describes the spatial orientation of that orbital. And that possibility goes from negative L to L, considering zero, and we represent that with ML. By referencing the periodic table, we can actually see a change in the principal quantum number as we go down the periods. This will introduce new angular quantum values since that's dependent on the value of n, and as we go down, we'll introduce new magnetic quantum number values since that's dependent on l. And this is how we get the atomic orbitals. 
And these are the four main type of orbitals that are referred to. We have the S orbital, which is spherical, has an L value of zero. We have the P orbitals that kind of look like a dumbbell, their L value equals one. We have the D orbitals that they have an L value of two. And I guess you can say they kind of look like a clover. And the F orbitals or the L equals three orbitals, I don't know an example to describe their shapes. They're quite complex and we won't refer to them a lot. Now the interesting thing is, can't you see how the number of orbitals increases? This is because of the ML value. So for the P orbitals, we have an L value of one. That means we have three different ML values we can have, negative one, one, and zero. Now you see with the D orbitals, we have five different orbitals, and with the F orbitals, we have seven. And these are the atomic orbitals that we're gonna reference. Now backtracking just a little bit, do you remember when we talked about a node and how the probability of finding an electron is zero? Well, interesting enough, as we increase the number of nodes, we increase the energy of the wave because we're increasing in the frequency. And this is something that we can see with the atomic orbitals. Do you see how the s orbital is spherical? It has an n value that equals one, and there's no like lobes. But with the p, d, and f orbital, we have these lobes. This means that we have nodes. The p orbital has that one node between the two lobes. The d orbital has two nodes dividing all their lobes, and the f orbital has three nodes. This is why the p orbital has more energy than the s, the d orbital has more energy than the p orbital, and the f orbital has the most energy over all three. But even in the s orbitals, we start to see nodes as we increase in the principal quantum number. Since the 2s orbital has a single node, it has a spherical node dividing it from the 1s orbital, and this increases their energy. And we can see this if we plot probability density to the radial component, which is the distance from the nucleus. Remember, as we increase in the principal quantum number, or the n value, we're increasing in the size of the orbital. So the distance from the nucleus is going to increase. So as we increase to n equals 2, that s orbital has one spherical node. But as we increase to an s orbital of n equals 3, we have two spherical nodes. Even in the p orbitals, we increase in spherical nodes as we increase in n value. Since the 2p orbital, it has its original one node. But the 3p orbital has a node and the spherical node that it's increasing because of the increase of the n value. Let's talk about one more property of orbitals. And this is another property of waves, which means phase, which represents both a periodic cycle of a wave and the negative and positive amplitudes of that wave. Now, orbitals have phases. The different lobes of an atomic orbital can be at different phases. And this is important for when we talk about ponding because depending on whether we're gonna have constructive or destructive interactions between the orbitals depends whether or not they're at the same phase. And in this graphic here, we can see the different phases of the different types of atomic orbitals. The phase orientation also changes with the magnetic quantum number or the orientation in space. On the top of this graphic, this is just a few more examples of radial components, spherical nodes, and the distance and size of orbitals from the nucleus, such as with s orbitals, p orbitals, and d orbitals. Now, the graph to the left is just another representation, but this just focuses on the radio component. As we dive above and below zero, it's just representing the number of spherical nodes. Now it's time for us to take everything we've learned throughout this video and apply it to our first example of a covalent bond, H2, hydrogen gas. So each hydrogen atom has its own atomic orbital, and we're going to see how the two atomic orbitals and their wave functions apply to form a molecular orbital and its wave function. Now, there's one important rule though. The number of molecular orbitals formed must equal the number of atomic orbitals that contributed in the bonding. And this is where we get bonding and anti-bonding. And I know this can sound confusing, but just think about it like a wave. 
there's two different waves, two different ways two waves can interact with one another. They can either be constructive, meaning that the two waves come together and they create a larger wave, or destructive. That means that the two waves come together and cancel each other out. This is what's going to happen with bonding and anti-bonding. Bonding happens when the two atomic orbitals come together and are constructive or adding to one another. This usually results from the electron density being between the two nuclei, which results in an electrostatic attraction. Now, anti-bonding is quite the opposite. The electron density is on either end of the atomic orbitals, and the nuclei repel each other. It's a repulsion electrostatic interaction. This results in a destructive of the wave. This actually causes a node, a space where there's no electron density between the two atomic orbitals. And this is how we build the atomic orbital theory. And this is why it's really important to reference waves when thinking about bonding. Oh, we did it. We took everything from the wave particle duality principle all the way to talking about molecular orbital theory. I hope this video was helpful. In the next video, we're going to start talking about different types of bonds, such as sigma and pi bonds, and work our way to talking about hybridization. I just want to say all the graphics that you guys see in this video are for free download on my website. So if you want to study along, and I hope you guys have a great day and see you later.